Well, ever since last Friday night, we've been absolutely buzzing for this show to talk about the five goal thriller in Tala, Shamrock Rovers 3, Dundalk 2, we had Jordan Flores, we had Jack Byrne, we had a near hurricane on the Saturday, we had the weekend that the League of Ireland has badly been waiting for to talk about all of this later on in the show. We don't have the Duchess and the Duke, we do have Pat Finlan, and before all of that, we have Dan. Good intro, yeah. John. How are you? Jack Byrne met them uh, in the Guinness Storehouse last night. I live right beside it. They could have could have invited me or called up. No. It's very unlikely you would have got the shout for that, to be honest. Yeah. The royal family and the weasel, as you put it. That's a, that's a nice way of phrasing it, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like you know, he was probably already on a high after Friday and then he gets to like mingle with the, the great and the good, you know, yeah, of the world. She, uh, apparently she was like, I know you scored a nice goal, but uh, who's your man Flores? Yeah, no, yeah. She didn't actually well, say it's, it. him. it's more so Jack saying, you think your family's characters, you know, <laughs> should come around to come out of my place um, and you know, meet the whole I, I like the way Gary Ringrose is really respectful and Jack has the two hands in the pockets. What's the, what's the crack? Yeah, he's just, uh, he looks, mm. looks a bit starstruck, to be honest. Well, you know? do we need any more promotion of the League of Ireland after the week? Was Friday the biggest promotion the League of Ireland has ever had? I wouldn't go that far. Um, I think, Big, you know... Biggest? No, no. European runs, like, you know, like I think Dundalk in 2016 and Shells with a Pat Fenn and later. Now, that's the biggest. No chance. Right. No, no danger. But I think for a... Uh, I think for a sort of a, a domestic match, like for a league match... Or just uh, a goal, even. It just really delivered. Like, the goal was obviously amazing, you know, and that that added to it. But even just coming away from the game on Friday, and you do have these moments across the season where you, you, you walk away and you're like, oh, God, if it was only like this every week. And, I mean, it's not. That's unfortunately the reality. But so often, and we spoke here, I think, in preview last week about it's early in the season, there's going to be a bit of shadow boxing, it's going to be cagey, they're going to... Feel, and, and it would be natural that that would be the case. Didn't want to show their hand. But it was just a combination of factors, an early goal... The elements, uh, just the way the game panned out. Maybe the fact that both teams, like uh, you know, made mistakes, but but that actually added to the game overall as an occasion. And we got the best of what there is in the country. Like we still need other clubs to come with them. Um, but these top of the table games in recent years, which we've had, like they haven't always delivered. Like the Dundalk Cork rivalry was great, but the games, I don't think they delivered a game like that one in terms of Friday. And like it swung in, in several different directions. Um, you know, the goal was obviously a bonus, but even just the entertainment, the fact that it wasn't just that, you know, that, that didn't just punctuate like a, you know, a 90 minute bore. Like it could have gone either way. I mean, I think Rovers probably deserved to win. And in saying that, uh, Dundalk could have equalised at the end. I mean, you know, Pico Lopez with a brilliant last ditch header. And yet that probably didn't even get mentioned in a lot of the match reports and, and you know, discussions of the game because so much else happened. So it was brilliant. Like you just hope that, I mean, it was 24th of the April is the next game and you're circling that in the diary now. And again, I hope that this is like, this lays down the template for their games this season. Now, I think to a degree, it still shows how far the others are behind because I don't think there's other teams that could have, I don't think any of the other teams could have matched those levels probably on the night. And, you know, that's where we are. But I think look on the bright side of it, that you do have two like really good teams there and a rivalry that I think has the potential to last. Because there, there was such a good atmosphere at the game as well, listening back. And I know Pat Fenlon will will talk about the, the teams below maybe being a long way behind. But um, what struck me thinking back was it was a lot like the cup final in ways and that in general play, Shamrock Rovers were comfortably superior. But in terms of chances... Dundalk like had probably they, nearly they, as many they were, chances. They, 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 I don't think that's superiority. Like there was 25 minutes before half time where Dundalk were dominant, and I think that was the most dominant either team was in I the can't game agree with you at there, any then. point. No, they they, they they got the goal and they, they were got rallied. the goal and they and even Stephen Bradley spoke about it afterwards that they had a really difficult 15 minutes or so. Aaron yeah. Green like missed a sitter. That was prior that. to that. That and, was prior to and that. And they but did I'm, have obviously. But I'm talking about after that, and mm. I think it's, it was that period coming up to half time, and I think I think that's the, in a bizarre way I think Rovers will take the most heart from it. And I think that's what Bradley said that like they were against the ropes, they were maybe sucker punched a bit by the goal, and then Dalk were just turning the screw should have really have scored, should have gone in ahead and didn't. And then, you know, things things turned. And there's no doubt, like, the, the second goal, the, the, the Huben goal came against their own play at that stage. You know, I think that Rovers were just gradually getting on top and they didn't panic again. I think that's what they will take from it. I think there was a couple, I mean, Rovers lost Joey O'Brien early on. I think Sean Gannon was, was struggling in the second half. That was a factor. I think the game was so high tempo, it just became a bit stretched later on and the dog actually became a slightly bit more ragged compared to what they, they usually would. I even watch, you watch back the, the winning goal and 
I mean, Shields was was forward, like trying to press on and had a big defensive run back mm. before Jack Byrne scored, and they just didn't get the bodies around them, and it was just. It was a it was a bit unlike them. They conceded a goal from a set piece at two one ahead. When he, I, I actually think that Rovers were more dominant in the game in Tala last season that they lost than they were on Friday. But on Friday, in the key moments of the game, they hung in, they delivered, they they got through the rough patches, and then they they prevailed when they had the strong patches. But it was I mean it was a great game, and yet you could have had an equaliser at the death mm. as well. You know you could yeah. easily had it. If you're asking yours, come where were you when this goal was scored? My answer would be I was actually watching it on my phone at Dundalk Races, leaving the track. But Dan, what was the press box area like for this? I mean you must be just on your feet. No, well they weren't on their feet. That's actually inappropriate decorum. But um. Like it was an extraordinary strike. Um, now we, we actually did like we were at the angle. Now subsequently another clip has come out. This like oh this wasn't as good a goal. That angle is the one in it's like Lisa in in, in um, Jebediah Springfield. Like the the, the the myth is better than the truth. That this but it's, just don't show that angle. But it's it's at great. It's, it's just at a it's at a different angle. Mm. And he, we, we knew I knew that Manus had a touch. Like that wasn't a surprise to me. And then you watch like these these views here. Um, and you know there's a slightly different perception. But to me it doesn't change the technique, the pace, Absolutely. the power the athleticism and that's probably what I didn't appreciate at the time I was marvelling at the almost I, I made a reference to Paul Scholes because I always yeah. think of a volley from a corner we had Tomás that's Campbell's what, fan, fan video as well actually which um, gave yeah, kind of a, that gives us an impression of the flight of the cross mm, as well you know? and it was like um, as much as Man has got a touch here we go like this is the ball the, just the, you get the, a real the, sense the soldier, of, it, not, not, notwithstanding his right leg the, the power he has to put in that as a standing position but to get over the ball yeah. and um, funnily enough Flores and I'm sure his coaches will reflect on this he didn't have a good game that, like, so he had an amazing goal but he, he needs to do more in general play mm. if he's to be that player that maybe Dundalk needs in the centre midfield yeah. and he's, like, he's clearly a talented player mm. He's like he's had a. This is his first real crack at a run of games with Dundalk. I don't think he'd played two back to back. Two worldies in a few days. But he, you know, like to actually play a couple of games back to back, he hasn't done that. But mm. I, I still think it's an exceptional strike. I don't think oh, Manus. It's can, one of the best volleys like, I've ever seen. Manus couldn't keep it out. Like mm. it was, and the speed. And I think to a degree, you need to almost have been there to fully appreciate it you know to fully get a sense of just that wow factor that moment where it just it naturally just lifts you off your seat so um, I think it's goal of the season I don't think there's going to be a debate you can find any angles you want you never know that's not good I don't think it's going to be well topped. Flores was goal of the season up until that game now Flores is still goal he's running his own co- like he's running his own competition he, but um, it's a strange one for him because like you know like they've lost the game yeah I, he wouldn't be human if he wasn't absolutely buzzing by this reaction that it's been seen around the world, like over six million views, probably climbing on now. America, so, so someone saying in Australia, like Mark Bosnich was uh, oh, yeah. cor- correcting someone on the, the pronunciation of Dundalk on Australian TV. Like, but you can't really buy that sort of publicity. Like, like I, I've made this point about it before. Like, people go to games, go you know, go to sport in in this country or any sporting event. Like, you want to see people do things that you can't do. You want to see mm. things that kids will look at and go. Well, you were playing Astro you know, today. I doubt you did that. Like there was, first no, came back there was a, a lot of stuff that people yeah. could, you know, could not could, do. Could not, and that was, but, but in, a, in a negative sense of the yeah, word, like they would move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That would be one of the main Pitch things. Pitch battles. What have you got going on here? Well, this is a, a reference more so to the Cork Finn Harps game. I don't know if you saw the goal mail conditions. In, in interesting across. one, yeah. So I, I don't know the laws of the game. Maybe Pat Finn will help us on this. I don't know if that goal from Harps should have been disallowed or well, not. Well, there was a pitcher. There was a still mm. pitcher which does make it look like it was a foul but the striking thing about it from speaking to people that were there was that the goal actually uh, like the goal was given and the, the the distance between the goal actually being given and the goal being disallowed um, Shane Keegan spoke over the weekend about how both teams had reset into their position and it struck me as perhaps like Liam Bossan was, was out for the count and it you would nearly look at it and think that is this a delayed response to the severity of the injury and mm. you think oh how have we missed this that's just now Neil Doyle will have a different view we can't, well, Neil Doyle we can't, gave the goal. We can't interview referees yeah. to ask them about stuff and according really, to Ollie you know, Horgan so. the assistant didn't initially flag for it but I mean if you look back they should be able to change their mind on something and it, he, may, it may well have been a free well, kick well I know but like, like we don't have uh, VAR here mm. like you know yeah 
OK, if they reach the right decision, you probably should be well, happy. From your perspective, if, the, if, if you slide in on the goalie and he's kind of on the ground, is it is a dangerous play? It was near his head? Well, uh, you, look at the pitch, you look at the picture, it looks like a foul. But mm. like he, he almost he knew the conditions, so he, he executed a slide to, to make the connection. And Massive the win ball, for Cork, the ball was there. Massive win for Cork. But the point about pitch battles, you look at Talca, this is, this is the flip side. You have a brilliant game on Friday in Tala. And then you look at the highlights of elsewhere. Talca's struggling. No, no fault of the clubs. Ah, Dan, we've been a bit of a strong. No, no, these are, no exactly. And mm. they're cancelled grounds in some cases, and shells are leaving Tolkien. You know, like, you know, but Cork, it's been a factor. We've had, we've had games called off. We've seen Sligo Waterford and every schedule, other matches. It's just something like this weather is a problem that we have at the moment. And with our fixture schedule, it's, you know, it's, it's not great for the product and you just be a bit worried about the impact the pitcher is going to have in the coming weeks. Yeah, because we already um, had Daily Mount obviously getting a bad old dose from yeah, the first Yeah, it's game. just something that we have to be um, slightly aware the, of. The Galway freezing um, well, aspect we, to this, are we getting to Galway freezing? Well, no, 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 Galway is... We're already talking about Galway's, shells. Galway's fifth. Galway's yeah. fifth. No, she we've already mentioned shells. Uh, in what yeah. context? Like they beat St. Pat's Athletic, the pitch wasn't great. No, okay, no. let's talk shells. Can we get to Galway any week? <laughs> Maybe no. some week we will. Because I was in Tala for like the complete antidote to what Friday was. Yeah. Was so, so shells are obviously on the on the surge. But this we, we is can definitely the boy Dawson trying to get his way here, putting a bit of shells in there. Yeah, no, but shells is Massive great. Massive win. And they, 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 they've got experience as well. I mean, I know that there are newcomers to the Premier Division, um, but when you look at it, they've got Deegan, they've got you know players like Luke Byrne, players like Kilduff, um, and they seem to have a knack of like you don't hear people saying well shells have played especially well in the games but they have a good defensive Ryan record the as well. and they're, just... they're, they're grinding out the results and the points and I don't know who's going to be relegated this year you know normally like in recent years we've had maybe that one week team who's collapsed you know like you've had Bray and even UCD like you know their squad was decimated last year like I don't know this year there's no obvious contender um, and while we're probably bemoaning the lack of depth beyond the top two I think we could end up with this really, really interesting relegation race this year because I think, honestly, you could swing in a many, any variety of uh, directions. But we'll do a bit of goalie because it actually is a story. Um, the, it was just the, the, the nature of the, the game. The game should have been called well, off. You were there, right? yeah, was, was there any sense with 20 minutes to go that the game was... like? Was there people looking around asking the question? Well, uh, was, people, was, was players, managers talking to the officials about it? Did I, you see I, that? I, not, not really. And I think um, Alan Murphy at half-time like, took off a player who was basically blue but I think he was so wrapped up in both his centre backs being injured he didn't he, wrapped he didn't, up as an unfortunate time, yeah so. he didn't know what to do but the, the, the ball would not stay stationary at corner at the corner flag several times yeah I mean apparently it wasn't mentioned in the de match report delegates report mm. afterwards but it shouldn't have come no. to that I think it, there has to be some lessons learned from it definitely come back for uh, part two of the show we have Pat Fenlon Welcome back. Don't forget you can get us on the podcast format and on YouTube as well, uh, but mainly the TV show. And Pat Finnan, uh, a veteran of TV shows at this stage, but probably not a veteran of many games like Friday night. Absolutely. No, it was, it was a special game. Um, it was just one of them games. And I think from the start, um, because the hype around both clubs and both teams, um, I, I was expecting a really decent game. I know there's a little bit of talk, maybe a little bit negative, but... I didn't see it that way. I thought the two of them would have a right go at each other and in fairness about uh, teams, they certainly did that. You were a midfield general in the day. What did you think <coughs> of the midfield battle in general? Because I'd slightly disagree with Dan here in that as much as Dundalk had a patch, I thought they were struggling for large parts of the game actually in midfield. I thought Rovers started really well. Um, you know, But I thought for that 20 minutes, Dundalk played probably the best I've seen them play for a while. Um, even last season, I thought they were at it. and. You know, but again, Rovers showed that character come back in. I didn't think the midfield players were as good as they can be. I didn't think Shields was as good as he can be. I didn't think Jack Bourne was as good as he can be. You know, so it's fairly it was harsh on Jack, is it? No, not really. I thought I expect I expect him to be. You know, I thought his passing was awful. We scored a great goal in the end, and probably because we expect a fair bit from him. And the same with Shields. I thought Shields was off off the game as well. And um, so I just thought it was, you know, it it was. Tactically a good game, but I think both sets of players are sort of let play and go and, go and seek and they win the game. Um, I think one point that's missing from it is probably if you take Rovers, Lewis and Bork and Gary O'Neill, the two big players for them. And early on in the game. And I think, lose, yeah, right? well, I, I, and, and that's a big one as well mm. for them in the game. But I, th I think they're two players that would start for Rovers. Um, you know, and Bork is going to be a big player for Rovers this year, I believe. I, I believe that Rovers think, I know they brought in Gaffney, but I think they think that Bork will contribute 15, 20 goals in the season on the back of what he did before he went to Preston. So he was a big loss for them. So for them to come through it 
and win the game with missing them two and like you say Joey O'Brien getting injured it's a massive win for them What was the vibe like from the managers afterwards because obviously Dundalk would very rarely go from being 2-1 up to losing again Well I think that was the basic point of any part made and I think he was particularly frustrated by the the second goal the, the Lopez header because at that stage you, you almost think that Dundalk are going to manage the game with their experience and they don't really concede too many goals like that I mean it was a routine enough set piece you know and, and I think that, that killed them a bit and yeah, I didn't necessarily elaborate too much beyond that. I mean, Stephen Bradley was sort of, of course, in great form. And when you look at it, they've this season from last, I mean, they were one point against Dundalk last year. What, they, they eventually beat Bowes in the Cup semi-final, but in league, you know, did a dreadful record. They've scored late goals against both of them. They've also finished the game strongly as well. And I, I think one difference for Rovers as well, if you look at their changes on Friday that they brought on Joey. So they lost Joey O'Brien, they were able to bring on Scales, and then they were able to bring on Gaffney to give them something different. You look at the early part of last season against Dundalk, they went up there at the start of the season, they had to play young James Furlong in one of the matches because mm. they were tight. I think in Europe, remember Lee Grace was sent off, they had no defender on the bench. They just have options now that they maybe yeah. didn't have before. And actually, in a bizarre way, Dundalk probably had to bring in players who were new enough to the league and actually we're probably more untested in a way than, than Rovers in a bizarre way. I, I think that's the difference with the squads at the moment. I think Rovers have invested in their squad. You know, they've given Stephen the resources to go and have a right go at Dundalk and he's done that well. He brought in good players. And that is a big difference. When you lose Borky, you lose O'Neill, you lose Joey O'Brien in the game. They've had players to come in and be able to do the job where last season they might have been a little bit short if they'd have been missing them three players. So uh, looking strong at the moment. But again, as a game, it was, it was a very, very good game. I thought it was a part in the second half that dropped a little bit, but then it came again, you know, and the last, the last 15, 20 minutes was fantastic, I thought, absolutely I brilliant. think I think self-belief-wise as well for Sean Rovers and that, uh, Stephen Bradley referenced this, uh, I think, before the game, that kind of Sligo, Bowes and Rovers were their sort of hoodoo teams last year. <laughs> Whatever about Sligo, like against Bowes mentally, I think they were having problems because they were losing so many games. Against Dundalk, they couldn't get over the line. They've now comfortably enough beaten Bowes in their last, fairly comfortably two, and they've won their last three against them. They've now kind of beaten Sham they've kind of beaten Dundalk in their last two games and mentally they just seem to have this belief now that they're going to eke out wins and it must be a big advantage for them trying to win the title. Yeah, and it can be small margins as well. You know, if you take it last year, the Bowes games, I mean, did a couple of decisions went against them that were very harsh as well. You yeah. know, and, then, and then you take it in and, and Dan made a good point. Lopez, last minute clearance uh, last Friday. They're things that can go against you on certain nights. So, you know, we earned that right as well and you earned that look for them to, by working harder. And I, I think the different, their squad is much stronger. You know, they have invested in the squad. They've got some really good players in there. And when they lose one or two, they're able to, to bring in players that are more than capable of standing. And I think that's what Dundalk have had for a period of time. If they lose players, they brought in players that are more than capable of stepping up. Um, the thing about it now is a challenge for Dundalk. You know, I said before the game, right, there there's two things in it for me. It's the hunger of Rovers, you know, and have Dundalk still got that drive and determination to keep winning. Winning the way they've done over a long period of time is very, very difficult to sustain, mm. you know, and to keep doing that. And now it's a challenge to them because people are now talking about Rovers being the main, main challenge to them. They've had Cork on their heels for a period of time, and in fairness to Cork, they won a few trophies as well. But it's a big, big ask for them, Doc, now to come back as well and try win another league title. Uh, that's going to be interesting. I mean, their response to defeats in recent seasons has been one of the things that's defined them. They've gone on these big runs mm. after losing. And, but it's, like they have new players. I know McElhenney will come back and He's they have key, been missing him. But they're trying to you know, introduce players who, that haven't been in the league before. So And they go to Finn Harps on Friday, which I think is actually a real sort of... It's, a, it's actually a, a real challenging fixture coming off the back of it. So they've Kolovic, the Serbian guy, they're trying to integrate him. Mm. Slogat is still, they've, you know, they've had Shields and Benson or Shields and McElhenney. Slogat's still trying to find his way. Cameron Smith, Will Patching. They're just, they're just finding their way a small bit. And, but I think Rovers, and I think the one thing I took from Friday is I don't think these teams are going to drop too many points elsewhere. No. That's the point. You can't, you can't, so you, 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 you know, you can't be slack. Like you need to, both of them are going to have to maintain a winning, winning run to keep up with each other. I don't, think, I don't think the strength is there to challenge them regularly enough that you can afford to ease your way into it. They just have to start winning. You I know. think you would, one thing you got to be careful is you can't write Dundalk off. They're a very, well, they very good team. They have to play them twice at home yeah, as they've well. Got, you know? They've got some fantastic players and... Is right. There's a few of them coming in that are finding their way in the league. It's not an easy league to play in, you know. So, well, Pat, what if Rovers lose Jack Byrne in the summer, for example? Then does does everything change in the narrative? Because you no, can't see them. So. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. I think Jack is a, is a big part of what they have, but I think they've got a lot of good players in that position. You know, uh, I'm not sure they're going to lose Jack Bourne in the summer, to be honest. But um, he seems to be happy playing his football here, and it would have to be life changing for him to go and move away. I'd imagine at this stage. So 
I don't think so. I think what Rovers have now is they're out to go and replace. No player is irreplaceable. If they lose him, I'm sure they'll go and try to bring someone in. Or I've heard Stephen, and it's the one area of the team that they are really, really strong. If you take into account, like I said, Gary O'Neill is missing in that team. Dylan Watts comes into it. Bulger comes into it. So they've got some uh, real, real quality midfield players. We will discuss this a little bit more in part three, but uh, Pat was making the point that the distance between those two and the rest, it doesn't seem to have exactly shortened in the off-season. No, I don't think so. I think it's got wider. I think both of them have strengthened. And I think, you know, if you look at both of them sides and, and you take you take into the game on Friday as well, the one thing I take from you, look at the conditioning of both teams, you know, the fitness levels of both teams, really strong. And you look what they have behind them. You know, and, and and saying about trying to catch up and what can you do, it's really difficult when you've got the resources both of them clubs at the moment. It's it's difficult for other clubs, and and it's a different league for other clubs as well because some of them other clubs will be thinking we just need to stay in this league. Others will be thinking is there an opportunity with Europe, you know? So they all have little different agendas and 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 where they want to be as clubs. So, but I think the two of them are a long long way ahead. At the you moment. Did, you you made the point about you don't know who's going to go down, but it doesn't look exactly apparent who's going to finish third or fourth at the moment. No, I think both shells is going to be a really interesting game on on Friday. Now I know it's the TV, you know, it's the air game, and the two clubs you know very well, and like you hope it's going to be a great occasion, but you like it's you just know it's going to be a different. You know, quality of a, of a, of a fair you would think, but it's hard. I mean, like it's it's sort of an open house in behind. I don't know what you think, Pat. Your thoughts on the race for third or such? Or it's early days, probably with some of the clubs, isn't it? It is. When you look at some of them, shells have come up. Obviously, and people would think, well, you know, a team coming up is always in danger of maybe going straight back down. I don't think they will be. I think they've recruited really well. You know, Bowes have had that getting to Europe last year. There's a bit now expectancy for Bowes this year. Mm. Can they finish third? You know, I think people are expecting that to happen. Big squad as well. Yeah, they have a big squad. They've signed a lot of players and again, the club have backed the manager which is great to see. You know, and then there's Derry, I think Derry have a really decent squad. Um, I think he's done a fantastic job there as a manager. You know, so you're probably realistically looking at the teams that should be battling now for. I mean, Pats for me should be battling for that third position. I think Pats have underachieved over the last couple them. of. It has been a shaky Already start. Lost two games. I've seen him against Waterford, and again going back to, to last season, where the where the goals coming from, I think is going to be Pats' problem. Waterford again, I think if Waterford can stay in that league, they'll be happy. Harps will be thinking the same. You know, so it is interesting to see who can finish in that third and fourth position, and, and it, it does allow. You know some of the other clubs. We forget Cork, who've been a huge club Big over the last four for or five the years. Weekend. It was a massive win because you know they needed it just from a pressure point of view as well. And Neil gone in there. It's just it, it's it's you want to get points on the board quickly, don't you? And they've got some tough games coming up, so it was a big win for Cork. Relief for Neil Finn. Oh, like yeah, badly needed. And they had a couple of wobbles in the game, it seems. But yeah, I mean it's a new group of players. We, we spoke about it last week. They're still learning the league, and um, at least they have a few points, you know, three points on the board now to try and give them some kind of foundation. But I think you know, Pat's Cork on Friday is a, sort of an interesting game as well in terms of where they're both at. Yeah, we're only getting going here. Part three is uh, going to be uh, an in-depth part of the show in which we look at uh, some of the other teams this season. Just before we leave you on Air Sport 1, a reminder that we kick off our coverage this Friday in Daily Mount Park. It's the Dublin Derby as Bowes hosts Shells and Pat will be guest for uh, that game. And on Saturday night, top of the table, Shamrock Rovers travel west to take on Sligo Rovers at the showgrounds. Build-up gets underway at 7.30. And on Friday the 13th, we will be at the home of the champions, Seed and Dock against St. Patrick's Athletic. Steve O'Donnell returns to Oriel Park. All games are live on AirSport 1. Thanks very much for watching and do remember we are uh, as ever on podcast and on YouTube and uh, we'll see you next week. You're welcome back to YouTube uh, and the podcast. It actually looks like somebody uh, from a live studio audience has just handed me a note. But it does say from Conal at Conal Megan 13, after Rovers vs Dundalk, best LOI games in your memory. Ooh. Some good memories here now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Some it, involved in yourself, I hope. Yeah, I played in a few good ones, all right. Um, probably one of the better ones I played in was at Daly Mount. I think when Dermot was the manager of Shells, we beat Bow 6 4. Um, I think we were coasting at one stage 4 1. They got back to 4 3 and we ended up winning 6 4. But it was a, 
It was just one of them games. It was just goals galore and a bit manic at times. Also have you played. been to his bar in Lanzarote yet? I, I haven't, no. Jim McLaughlin was there the other day. I've seen that, yeah. yeah. Jim is over there. It's great to see Jim looking well as well. So, you know, Dermot's uh, living her up at the moment, yeah. you know. Could never see him running the bar in Lanzarote, but when I played on the rumble. He's still doing fairness, a blog as well uh, on the league from time him. to time, yeah. yeah. He, just, he just does a blog hammering Fran Gavin and a few other people every couple of weeks. And then he, like, goes back and then, you know, it follows on from there. It, it does look a great little enclave for uh, League of Ireland fans over there, but other games anyway that's coming Yeah, I, I, probably the other one that stands out is actually playing for was against Shells. Funny enough, the game this weekend we beat Shells four one in Tolka, which was a big win for us. We, you know, it was a year of I think it was a year where it was a three way playoff. It was a bit of a bit of a shambles at the end, but it was probably one of the better performances I played in in a Bowes team. You know, so yeah, there's so many of them. Like it, it, I suppose in relation to goals, there's loads of them, yeah. and then there's games where you maybe win a league and they're not as good, or win a cup and you know they're not as good. So. Probably too many to, to think there's of. There's two moment. different grades, isn't there? Like, there's the high scoring games and there's the high quality games. And I think actually I like Friday because I had a bit of both. I had goals, but it was actually a good level. Like, you think of, uh, you know, you think of a 6 4, the, the Rovers 4 1 back to 6 4. Sandry Massacre. Dave Smith getting thrown under the bus afterwards mm. by, by Rico. And that was a great game, but like, that was like in Santry, the pitch was cutting up. Maybe was it a great advert in the way that you would use that term about Friday? But then, like you, you would also think of, and I was sort of mentioning to Pat off air, like I think around 05, 06, like you had Shells, Cork, Derry, even Drada. I remember, got, like, and that's the thing about like there was four good teams. I remember you'd be going to just that was a high quality game, not necessarily an epic like memorable. You'd won then in mm. Cork, I think, which you won, and um, wasn't like this is in a, a, a thrill a minute game. You're thinking this is a good good level. It's a good match, and there were some of the cup finals as well. I know it's sort of talking mm. about league games, but the Derry Pats Cup final, the the last one in the old Lansdowne, even the Sligo draw the one had a drama in it. You know, like there was mm. the the little chip over the wall by uh, Joey and Doe, wasn't it? So we've had some good ones, but I think Friday really, I think it set a pretty high bar in terms of recent memory. I don't know if you you have any any of your own memories. Remember the Dawkins goal we had one back in the day on a Monday night. It was a cup. It was a cup replay. It was like four three. The yes. game. The game should have been called off. I think it that, was. Uh, that, that's gone back a good while now. That's gone back slightly before. Jumbo my Brennan time. played like Nin mid mid nineties. Yeah, mid nineties. And yeah. Uh, it was that was an insane. One of the, like that was. I was at that game as a kid. It was just, this is incredible. But uh, would have been called off now without a shadow of a doubt. One of my favourites would have been. Um, Galway United losing 3-2 to Derry City but Liam Coyle scoring one of the best goals I've ever seen and just I suppose realising at that time that uh, not, not enough people appreciate how good a player like he was but I, I have to say Pat that the standard has gone up where we maybe expect kind of there was so much quality in that game on Friday I think that makes a good point there the 6-4 in the Martin Stadium that time the days of winter football it was a lot more kind of rushed and frantic but I, I thought technically the game had an awful lot going for it on Friday, and I don't think that's unusual now. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent that it, the standards improved dramatically. Um, from I think, your, I, your yeah, yeah. yeah, well, even from playing or managing, I think we like and said that time where where I managed shells, you 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 know you you and you'd sport and Fingal as well in there who were spending money. That period, you'd, the you'd level you'd was very You'd Pats, yeah. you'd Cork, a lot of good good teams, a lot of good players. You know, I think at the moment we probably two teams that are a long long way ahead. And it's an interesting point you talked about earlier on about pitches. You look at Daly, you look at Tolka, you look at Bally Buffet, and then you look at Tala. So there's no excuse for a pitch to be bad, in my eyes. You know, Tala was, I walked the pitch in Tala, it was soft in areas, but it was absolutely I will. Immaculate. I will say though, Pat, in the, in like it probably rains twice as much in the West than the East generally. <laughs> That's actually factually, I think, true. But it's, I think it rains. What's yeah, but I think what's happening, sorry to cut across you, I think what's happened with Tala is that Tala, as a ground, is like, uh, you know, this has been used like it's hosting women's internationals 21. Yeah, it was, it, 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 it was still it, waterlogged it, it, on Saturday. But the problem with yeah, yeah, this, this, this is our showpiece league. This is mm. the biggest league in the country. If Tala can be in the condition it can be in, Tolka can be in the condition. Daily Mount, they're all council on ground. Surely they can all be in the same. No, I agree. I think I think and part of Daily Mount, the first game against Rovers was scandalous, and Tolka hasn't been good the games I've seen. So it's no, and they're the little things that can let us down as a league. Mm. You know, you're talking about a standard of quality of football. If you give the players something decent to play on, I, I, most times they produce but a decent. But game. in your in your era, right? <laughs> if you if you played in summer football era, I, I believe it would have been a different standard because the pitches were invariably quite bad in those days. I mean, and yeah, I, I, listen, that that can it's I, a bit of an excuse now. Well. It is, but again, I, I can relate back to the winter football, as you call it, and the best team to ever play in the league that I've seen was Shamrock Rovers in the 80s. 
you know, they played through all them pitches. Milltown was a carpet, but they had to go and travel away. So it can, it can, it, it definitely can help. And I think the one thing summer football has, has done, it allows teams to train more, it allows them to train longer on better surfaces as well in, in daylight, not having to train under floodlights or maybe in car parks like we did back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know, so that has improved the game. You've made, you've made an interesting <coughs> point there. So that Rovers team of the 80s, to your mind, was the best League of Ireland team in your sort of lifetime or from what you remember. So comparable to the Dundalk 2016 team or the Shells team that you managed, they were still the best. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, I, I think that that, and again, people go back forward to other great sides, but that Rovers team is the best team I've seen. I'd, I'd, I'd love them to put them in this area where it's full time and and being able to just concentrate on the football, but they're some fantastic players, absolutely fantastic mm. players. Yeah, I think that is one of the interesting points about the league and the time which we've probably watched it, that when we started watching it, like say in the 90s, it was wholly part-time. And mm. probably a lot of players have always thought this, that if they'd had the opportunity now, when they came home from England, say, Tony to, Sheridan, to, be in, to, to be in the Rovers and Dock environment, mm. what could they have done? Like, I, I think maybe if levels have improved now, it's probably the... It's the probably the conditioning and, and athleticism rather than say footballing ability. Yeah, and that's where I go yeah. back to the point of even the summer football training. I started at St Pat's. We trained behind the shed end in Inchicore in that the sheep were still on that were going to get slaughtered. It was just a muck bat. Lights were really bad. I was half blind at the time anyway, so it made like it worse. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it was just so if you actually think of back then, to, and we won a league on the back of that you know, to, to know what the players have. And that's great because it's improved and that's what you wanted. But it's difficult to compare eras as well because it's, that Dundalk team has been absolutely fantastic. Well, whatever about comparing eras, how, how do we compare North and South at the moment? You're obviously uh, in Linfield day to day. Um, the, the, the league up there goes over the heads of a lot of people down here, sadly enough. And mm. um, you were just telling me there, Bastian Erie's not really getting his game at the moment. I didn't even know that. I just assumed yeah. he was. So what's going on up there? You've, you're, you're, you're finishing the league, or you're finishing? Yeah, we're on we're on the home strike anyway. now. Yeah, yeah we're, we have two games left before it splits into uh, top and bottom. So it'll be interesting. We're we're four points ahead at the moment. So it's a tight league. You know, there's probably been up till the last couple of weeks. There's probably been four or five th teams that could win it. It's probably dropped off maybe to two or three now. So. We had a sticky spell the last few weeks. We've been very good. So we're hitting a little bit of form at the right time, which is brilliant. But it's a tough league. I mean, I played in it as well. It's a tough league to play mm. in as well. Uh, Standard-wise, comparing the two leagues, I would think the league down here is a little bit stronger at the moment. There's no doubt with that. I think the dundalk Linfield result proved that in the United Union Cup final. So, um, But we're making strides, and they're making strides up there. There's two or three clubs now looking to, you know, at the full-time model as well. So, But it'll take a bit of time to catch up, I would think. Yeah, I suppose the All-Earned League chat has gone fairly quiet then. Uh, yeah, it has. I mean, I think it's, it hasn't gone away, but I, I think they're obviously... I, I don't mind it going quiet so much because I think where things were left was the clubs are looking for more information and looking for a bit more detail, and you would assume that they're off in the background doing that. Um, so, I, I mean, there's a lot going on at the moment. Um, I mean, we, we are starting... Look, we have, again, we have the new authorities running the FBI. I don't know, I was interested in Pat's views on this. We've we've heard early noises from, from Niall Quinn and from, I guess, from Roy Barrett and, and the, the new people that it does seem that the league is going to be more front and centre. Even privately, you're hearing that there's things, there, that things are going to happen in the next, some announcements or stuff in the next while are probably going to happen. So, like again, it even, even goes back to pitches and the presentation and the product and stuff. I think a lot of this stuff can be centralised to some degree. I know the clubs have to have their own responsibility and pride, but again, if you're talking about increased funding and whatever it might be, I think you know you have to prioritise pitch maintenance and a level and a standard that you know that you're not just giving clubs to the money to to squander it. You know that you're actually improving the product. But I don't know what you think, Pat, as someone who probably would have been quite critical of the. If we can call it the old FEI now, I don't know if we can use those terms yet, but are you sort of encouraged by what you've heard thus far from the new people? Yeah, I'm encouraged. Um, you know, you want to see change and you want to see quickly and probably want to see a little bit quicker than it's happening for me. Um, I think there's some good people have gone in there, so you're hoping that they're allowed to start the process and continue that process to, to, to develop the game. The big, the big difference for me and the key for me is that the League of Ireland has been at the top of the discussion. Mm. For years, we've always been... You know, to hear the League of Ireland being mentioned even in the Dáil or, you know, politicians mention it, that's 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 unheard of for their yeah. league. So, And the people have come in have now seen that there's a product there. There's also the, the, the fact that, you know, we've got to start producing players at national level, you know, and it's mo getting more and more difficult for young players going away. So we need to give them an alternative here, which means the league has got to develop to get better. You know, so I'm hopeful 
at the moment. Probably hopeful is the is the, is the word. I know. I know you make a good point about this. That we we're almost like really paranoid about what others think of the league and the standard and all that. But Mick McCarthy genuinely seemed like he was like this is a great adversary for the League of Ireland the other night. And I was like, I know he missed the Jack Byrne goal, but at the same well, time, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the the, the FEI book of quotes I think were used there. I wouldn't be going playing, placing too much stock on the quotes that he used. But it, like th- th- that was a good game, but that that's not the norm. You know, we need we need we need more of that. Mm. Um, but I, I do think that that and I think that's the significant point that Pat makes that it's actually part of the discussion. Like even that goal was in the late late show on Friday night after and stuff and like again, you know, it was packaged, it was it went around the world quickly. Like it's it's all part of uh, being a modern league. But like, I do think that in a weird way, that day in the doll before Christmas when Shane Ross, without probably thinking, said, "Oh, if the if the FBI goes, the league goes." I think in time that will be remembered as a quite an important day mm. because there was a backlash from that. I think you know the league had been beaten down to the point where the the the, the, the clubs nearly thought that to to lobby politically they had to do it all through the mm. FAI. You know they didn't really, and and that was partly through their own weakness and maybe you know they just didn't understand that the power that they had and they were able to actually and in the, the aftermath go hang on we contribute to communities we employ in communities you know we bring something that maybe it's not. Every Everywhere it should be more widespread, but there's still like a couple of hundred like employees that are as affected by this as the staff in Abbottstown, and that I think will go down as a day that was important because all of a sudden politicians were, and I noticed were on the back foot. They were rattled by the criticism they were getting, and then they're hosting meetings and they have to come out and be seen to follow up on it. Well, so it like, you have to build in this momentum now yeah, and not let it go. Absolutely. It was like the it was the James Conley line: "The great only appear great because we're on our knees." And the League of Ireland clubs were downtrodden. And when you look at today uh, or yesterday, rather. The HRI, Horse Race Nardle brought out this five-year plan, speaking about more government money coming in, and football has just plodded along, biggest participation sport in the country, and you mentioned that this is this is rare that there's actually, it's even brought up in the doll. Yeah, but I think that, that was a position that we were put in, you know, that was where we were in the box to say... Within there. the football community? Yeah, I think so, yeah, I think that was, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that the game, the League of Ireland is the top game in this country. And it should be at the top of the game in the country, and it should be making involved in the big decisions that are made in this country, you know. And I don't think that's been the case over a long period of time, you know. But again, some of that again, the clubs have to take responsibility for, you know. Did they were they strong enough to speak up, you know, and and probably not at the time. But it was difficult for a lot of them as well because you know they needed people within the association to be bailing them out at times. So, but I think that the fact I think it's. Rather than look back, I think it's to look forward, and you've got people now to ha- have an interest in developing the well, game. Do you believe in Niall Quinn, for example? I, d- I believe Niall has an interest in developing the game here. Yeah, absolutely. I think as a, I think he has an interest. I mean, Niall is not coming from a League of Ireland background, but he knows that you know, even going back to the young players that have gone away, and he's done that. That that's not healthy at times for some young players, and to be able to keep them at home. So I think to develop the clubs, we have to have an alternative. They're still going to go at the moment because we don't really have many alternatives. You see Rovers doing a bit of work in relation to the academy and some of the other clubs, but there's no real alternative to keep these kids here. You know, so I think that's part of the, the development structure as well. Not just the League of Ireland, but the always structure of the clubs are in the League of Ireland mm. to make them pillars of the community and make sure that you know there's plenty of work going on and make the product better. That's what it's about, is making it. If you make the product better, as you've seen last week in Tallaght, people will come and watch it. And it's peculiar because if you look at the gates for the last few weeks, I take Shells, for instance, and the, the great team, Shells team that I had, or one of the ones that I played in, we just struggled to get 3,000 people mm-hmm. to watch them. You know, this Shells there team... There is a buzz, Pat, though. Yeah, no, there is, and, yeah. and that, but it's, why? I don't, and I'm not, I'm asking the question, I don't know why that buzz is there. A lot of the social media, I, I think, think so, with Shells yeah. is the fact that they were out of the league for so long as well, but Pat's, Pat's got a very good crowd for their Absolutely. first game. Um, Derry have had two very good crowds. But the key to that, and he is, is maintaining is keeping it. Yeah. If Shells, Shells at the moment are at a point where they're getting 3,000 people, if Shells can maintain 3,000 people for every home game, they well, won't have any financial I, I, do, I think on Niall Quinn, though, for example... The Shells are going to have eight games in a month at some stage, yeah. too, and that's what's going to... But, but Niall Quinn, them, like the, the timing of the Flores goal and that game, I think, in terms of... Lots of people are kind of now more conscious of the league or they know more, and Niall Quinn can say, well, this is kind of what we have, or we could have, but we could be so much more. Yeah, I don't know what the reasons for it is. I think there's been a bit of an awakening for whatever reason. I think Bows have done extremely well, and they've made it a night out. So, you know, it's, it's not just about... The levels of the football it's about the experience and, and like we always talk about match day experience and you know there's that's clearly a bit of a buzz but mm. I, I like I, you know I always say early season crowds can be a bit misleading like they're good every year generally and um, but there is something I think in Dublin 
I feel, I sense it. I don't know where it is. I think is it a is it a backlash at the, the Premier League becoming yeah, so well, so I, soulless mm. that you, you I think there's a part of that. Then. I think there is a part of that that people are sort of a little bit fed up with what's going on, watching on the box and seeing the stuff that's going on. And I think, like you say, social media is a huge part of playing as well. But we have seen early season crowds being good. But they're they're a lot better than they've been. Yeah, no, they you know, are. And, and if they can maintain that, and that's the challenge for Bowes have done it. In fairness, Bowes have maintained their crowds because, like you say, the game is part of the night, but it's not that everything of the night mm. is the biggest part of it. But they're able to maintain their crowds there. Can shells do that? Can Pats do that? We've seen a drop off in Cork's crowd because mm. the team has probably dropped off in standard. So it's trying to, and that's where the big issues for clubs is that you know air supporters are not not the supporters, genuine supporters will go. More people will go if they're winning, but once they start to drop, and in Shell's case, it's going to be a good example. They're at a good level now. They've won a couple of games. If they have a little dodgy spell, which they will have in the season, does that yeah. drop off drastically, or is it just a, a small well, drop off? There's, there's not one person among the seven and a half thousand odd who was at that game Friday who wouldn't want to go again. But uh, what are you looking forward to the weekend, particularly another yeah. interesting? Well, I'm going to see. I'm going to see Pats and Cork because I haven't seen Pats yet, so I'm just interested to see what, what Pats are like. And I would have expected them to be a bit better, but I suppose the flip side, it is early season for some of these teams, and you hope maybe after 10, 11 games yeah. they'll get better. And maybe it's just that the Dalkin Rovers are so established that. It's hard, but you'd you be a small bit alarmed. That's what I'm looking forward to. See how Dundalk respond even up to Harps. I think that's a tricky game. I actually Big think time. that's a really, that's a test for them coming off the back of uh, last weekend. You're up in Belfast soon the weekend, are you? No, we've uh, we've no game. We're away on Saturday, but I'll be in Daily Mount on obviously walking for the game on Friday. I'm looking forward to uh, Shells. I completely forgot about that. Shells. Because Remember where we are, John? Yeah, because yeah, no, yeah. it has. It read it out a few minutes, yeah. but he was actually on it. <laughs> it hasn't happened for a while, and and again, you're going back to rivalry. You know, when I was playing for 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 Shells, we had a huge rivalry. Rivalry with Pat's at the time, Pat Dolan, Ollie. You know, built and it was brilliant. Characters. You know, they were they were brilliant for the game because they drove and the gates were brilliant. We had that rivalry with Bowes when I was a manager. We saw in Crowey and Bobby Ryan and Hawkins and it caused absolute mayhem mm. and going back You're there. You're smiling now even thinking <laughs> yeah, about it. Yeah, it was brilliant. It, it, yeah, yeah it, was, it was, but it, it drove the rivalry and that's what you that's need in the game. Means. You need characters to drive the rivalry game. So I'm looking forward to going back to, to Daily Man. I think it'll be a cracking game. I think we can safely say that Dundalk Shamrock Rovers rivalry is only getting going. Thanks a million to Pat for coming in and we will of course see Pat on the box on Friday. I forgot about that. Uh, thanks a million for watching and listening. We'll see you next week.